Hello, everyone. I'm uh, David Zilber, uh, a Canadian chef, uh, artist, as, artist as well. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've always been interested in the sciences my entire life. My father was a, an aerospace engineer. Um, I grew up with books on Carl Sagan as well as Shel Silverstein. Uh, and I just happened to end up in the world of food. I, it was by happy accident, I think, that I ended up in the fermentation lab at Noma. I think my boss just realized that I was always carrying a book in my uh, backpack and they felt that I had the ability to understand these processes, um, maybe more so than your average cook. So it is a real, uh, a real special job that I have and one that I don't take for granted. Um, I'm a bit of an outsider here. It's not like I have a PhD. I don't have anything more than a high school diploma, but it is an interesting perspective that I have on the world of cellular agriculture, especially in, when it comes to fermentation. I feel like it's something that can definitely change the face of the earth and uh, presents interesting opportunities to chefs and people who make food on a regular basis, not just uh, big agricultural industries. Um, I think that there are a lot of game-changing facets to what we can produce um, with synthetic biology and uh, and microbes, really. But I'd like to uh, bring up my panel, uh, four fine gentlemen who've started doing some pretty cool things with, uh, with microbes in the world of fermentation. So we have uh, Ryan, Arturo, Alexander, and Camille. And uh, if you guys could uh, all just take a second, we'll start with you, Ryan, at the end, to uh, introduce yourselves and what you guys do in food space. Absolutely, and thank you very much, David. Pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for everyone who's here. Incredibly full room I'm now seeing at this angle. Um, my name is Ryan. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO, along with Paramal, uh, of Mufri, uh, developing ways to make dairy products without any cows. Um, as Isha said, we spun out of New Harvest back in 2014. It's been just over two years since we got started, and uh, we're having a blast. It's really cool. I can't wait to tell you guys more about it. Hi everyone, I'm Arturo from Clara, and similar to kind of Mufri and Gelza, and we produce proteins uh, to replace egg, egg products, in particular egg whites. Uh, and our technology focuses on really like the functional properties of, of these products, is that companies use egg whites not because they want to, but because they have to, because they do things that, ingre that many ingredients can't. They foam and bind and leaven in ways that, that are almost impossible to replicate. And our focus is on really kind of zeroing in on those properties and truly kind of being able to push the envelope on creating better kinds of foods and ingredients that are, have you know, previously been impossible to do. So we also spun out of New Harvest and have our base in San Francisco in Dog Patch. If you all want to visit us, uh, let me know. And we're also actively recruiting, so shameless plug there. Hi, my name is Alex Lorstani. I'm the co-founder, along with Nick Uzanov, who's back there, and CEO of Gelzen. Uh, we make performance ingredients using the tools of biotechnology. Right now, we're focused on collagen and collagen derivatives like gelatin. Uh, I'm completely obsessed with gelatin. I think you should be too. I'd be happy to, you know, talk more about that later today. Um, but you know, I'm just first of all, I, I really just want to say I'm so delighted to be here and very humbled to be in the company of so many great people that think deeply about the problems that uh, I care about a lot and that our team cares about a lot. So uh, thanks, and I'm excited to be with you today. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Camille Dolebec. I'm the CEO of um, Affiner, which is a startup that focuses on using fermentations to improve the chemistry of different plant-based foods. Um, so as Gilan was saying, you know, we have 7,000 years of history with fermentations, but a lot of things have you know, happened, especially in the past 10 years. We're starting to really understand what microbes can do and, and what enzymes they can produce. And so what we do is that we create um, artificial mic microbial consortia uh, that are able to precisely chew away not really interesting molecules in food products and you know, enrich in other ones. So you know, both improving the nutritional profile and the, the, the flavor profile of different plant-based foods. And we're starting with coffee, so we'll tell you a bit more about that. But I'm thrilled to be here as well. Great, thank you guys. Uh, now we'll get right into it. So there is, it's, fermentation is a world unto itself. I mean, these are microbes that Effectively, we've domesticated for the past 7,000 years or more. I'm sure yeast has been riding on our coattails all through human evolution. Um, and today, we're, we're really seeing 
there's, there's a quote I love by um, Edward O. Wilson. He says in one of his books, the ships that brought us here are left to be scuttled, burning at the shore. We really do seem like we're on the precipice of a paradigm shift in the world of food, whether it's um, the synthetic biology, whether it's cultured meat, whether it's synthetic biology as applies to fermentation. Um, even in what I do, even what, and what I do is, is very traditional. I take um, lineages of microbes that we've known very well for thousands and thousands of years, whether that's Aspergillus oryzae, um, as, it's, as it's known in Japan to make sake and miso and soy sauce, whether it's uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae to, to make kombuchas, to make vinegars um, by producing wine and then you know, getting this whole flight of acetic acid bacteria to, to get in there. So what I do is really just kind of shifting around the known world of fermentation to coax out new flavors, to create new products. And when it comes to you know, the public pushback on genetically modified organisms, which well, the majority of you guys uh, dabble in, I would say that it's the exact same or the, an exactly analogous argument to what popularizers of science say when you know, they talk about canines, when they talk about other domesticated animals that we know. Um, you know we've been breeding dogs for 40,000 years, and we have forms of dogs that are completely unnatural, that you know, require C-sections to uh, continue their gene line. Um, and now we can, if we wanted to, create new species of dogs with genetic modification. I think it's the same argument, um, you know, it, the same exact framework that we have here on this panel. Um, now, within the world of fermentation, how do you guys see yourselves? Is, is fermentation a framework that you guys would like to be seen as working within? Or are you synthetic biologists first? How do you guys perceive yourselves uh, with your products, and how do you think the public will react to Mufri, let's say, you know, being a, a fermentation first company versus a synthetic, a, a synthetic biology first uh, based company? You, you want to start? Ryan. Yeah, definitely. A couple, a couple things there. So I, I first want to speak to the dog analogy because I think there's a critical difference, which is that there's a question of why, right? And if you're making a new breed of dog, I think it's tough to find a compelling reason for that, but there are compelling borderline desperate reasons, I think, to do the things that we're doing here in terms of food. Um, and that's, that's a big thing, I think, for a lot of people, because you, you can do something just to be a mad scientist or to make more money, or you can do it to really you know, impact global problems, right? And I think that's part of it. Um, with respect to fermentation, I think it's less, it's less of a you know, choose synthetic biology or fermentation as your identity. It's obviously a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Um, it's, it's a really handy and really important metaphor, I think, because it's, it's, when you're doing something new, when you're really breaking new ground in this kind of field, I think it's important to relate it uh, to things that are already familiar. And in a lot of ways, um, what we're doing is familiar. And I think that's, that's the reason that we lean on fermentation, because you want to know what to picture, right? You're, you're saying, I'm going to make food in a new way. Um, there aren't going to be cows necessarily producing a lot of the dairy products in, in 20 years. Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? And luckily, we kind of know the answer. It looks like beer brewing, or it looks like how wine is made today. And I think that helps a lot of people, and it's really important, but we can't lose sight of the fact that there are key differences. And I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into more of that on the panel, but I think the big difference is purification, where it, when, you're, when you're fermenting something like beer, you're really using that finished product. And maybe you'll filter it a little bit, but um, all that complexity is a big part of what you interpret as fermentation, whereas, at least in our case, what we're doing is we're producing a singular, really important product, which is milk protein, which is that really high quality, bioavailable, digestible protein that we're really missing um, in a lot of dairy alternatives today. And we're able to make that, but we don't want necessarily anything else. Or we want to know that we're getting very pure, you know, just milk protein. And so I think that difference where we're saying we're, we're fermenting, right, but we really only want that one protein um, is, is an important detail too. Yeah. And Arturo, you were, you were saying the same thing earlier. Um, and this is another thing to, to, to talk about, really. Um, as as uh, Gilon was mentioning, you know, rennet has been um, produced via fermentation, animal-free, for quite some time now. And when you come across rennet like this, and it's the same thing with citric acid produced by Aspergillus niger, even though these are genetically modified microbes that are doing the, the bulk of the work for you, it doesn't have to be labeled on the package that 
you've used a genetically modified organism to produce your end metabolite. Is this something that we should, moving forward, address? Should we just go out and say, listen, we've, we've changed an organism in such a way that we can produce this. Should it be something that we, um, should it be something that you guys just kind of fold into what you do? Should you just be out in the forefront with it? Or by the, by the, just the, the happenstance of regulations yeah, today, yeah. is it something that you just want to skirt around? Will, will consumers feel duped if you don't tell them? I mean, I, I don't think there's a way to do it otherwise. I mean, I think for us, at the end of the day, it's, uh, the reason why we're so excited is the process itself. We don't want to hide behind what we're doing because I do think that there's, it's, there's something very special about why we're doing it and how we're doing it that I think if people know about it, uh, it's not something that will necessarily come to, uh, uh, to hate or even maybe just accept, but truly embrace as a new way of creating food. Uh, and I think that, I think that, that may have been a mistake in the, in the industry over the last few decades of, of not sort of being fully transparent about what we're doing. And I think for us as startups, I mean, you can put a face to the name of the people doing the science. You can put a name to the people uh, that, are, that are kind of creating these new products. And like we on our Facebook page, you can see a video of me describing the process. I mean, I think for us, it's, it's transparency is key. Uh, and I think if we only, if, the more people know about this, I think, the, the more we can allow consumers to make that choice. Ultimately for us, it's about giving a choice to people that want to consume healthier, more sustainable, and, and more ethical, more ethically produced products. And I think that's something that, we're, that we want to celebrate and not hide, not hide behind. Um, now, the fact that we can start doing these things is, is impressive. It's, it's a feat to you know, the, the structure of science and, and how far we've come. It's one thing to just be able to produce casein. It's one thing to you know, make milk that doesn't taste like yeast, but do you guys see a possibility in, after just getting there, you know, being able to become artists in a way, in, in the same way that we have cheese artisans that produce very specific flavors of you know, brie in France and, and things that have their own terroirs. You guys could work in labs and effectively, you know, you, you could end up with different flavors of milk. You could end up with different collagens that had um, different, you know, gelling consistencies that would, for a chef, be extremely useful. Um, and in your world, with coffee, that's, there's, there's a lot of possibility there. Is it, now, baby steps, I know, but is this something that's consciously on your mind? Um, Camille, well, what do you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, so, the, the, the world of coffee is, is very interesting because, so, there's been kind of a shift recently in the past, you know, five, ten years. People are more and more worried about the process behind, you know, producing high-quality beans. And so these words like terroir and all this knowledge that comes from wine and other products is, is starting to, to, to get into the, the coffee world. Um, so, yeah, we, we do think a lot about terroir. Um, and terroir for us is... is, is um, is bigger than just you know where um, the, the the coffee bean is growing and, and and the people that process it. It's also you know all the microbes that that were you know involved in uh, either the natural fermentation that happens when you get rid of the fruit around the um, around the coffee bean, or or you know um, yeah. All, so all these things are part of, of terroir. And how do we how do we use that? Um, so the so what uh, maybe I should I should. You know, tell you a little bit more what we do on coffee. So, but basically, what we do is that we do a secondary fermentations. So, after after the bean is processed, um, you know, when the roaster uh, receives the bean, it's just it's just the, the, the dried bean without the fruit, and we, we we basically seed them with chosen microbes to get rid of of of, of, of non-interesting molecules, and those interesting those molecules can be flavor molecules. So all the bitterness and acidity of coffee we're getting rid of. Um, we're improving the sugar profile of coffee, and also we're trying to make a, a healthier coffee. Um, so there are a lot of known irritants in coffee, and about 20% of people are very sensitive to those molecules, and so we, we can use those, those microbes um, to, to choose those away. Um, so, so essentially, um, at Affino, we're building um, um, a screening technology, a screening platform where we basically uh, go and, and, and find all these interesting microbes coming from different terroir, and basically we try to 
we use them in kind of a rational way, like you know, uh, picking the ones that are interesting and, 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 and getting rid of, of the ones that are not. Um, so, so, so terroir is, is absolutely part of the story. Um, we, we use microbes that come from those terroir where, where, where the coffee is grown. Um, Offers Coffee actually was launched recently, like um, a few months ago, it's called Cultured Coffee. Uh, so if you guys wanna check it out. Uh, but these, these beans come from, from Tanzania, and some of the microbes that we use to refine those, this coffee come, come from, from, from Tanzania also, actually. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, terroir is very, is very important. Um, and, and being open also to go back to, to the, the earlier di discussion, to be open about the process is something that, that is very important to us. We launched the product on, on Kickstarter um, and, and the idea was really to have this kind of open discussion with, with people and tell them about microbes and how we can you know, harvest what they can do to make, to make better food. And I think that's very essential for, for all of us. And Alex, this kind of applies to you as well, but do you, do you see yourself as being able, or, or is it interesting to you to, you know, to become like a, a custom bespoke protein producer? Um, sure. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, we're not a we're not a fermentation company. We're not a synthetic biology company. We're an ingredients company. And when people think about ingredients, uh, and this is something that we've learned just from talking to partners, what they really care about essentially is the functionality. You know, we're not we don't well, the value that we add is not through a whole food product per se. It's through a functional ingredient. It, you know, this kind of echoes a lot of what you've heard on the stage today. Um, so right now, we are constrained by massively available sources of, you know, in our case, collagen. So, you know, the skins of young pigs or the bones of old cows. Uh, and there's a very limited uh, functionality space there. Uh, nature has come up with many more solutions to what collagens can do. Uh, and right now, we have some very powerful tools at our disposal to raise those up in terms of their abundance. So, you know, if, if you want to have a collagen that is uh, relatively sparse in nature, but would be very interesting to a food manufacturer, um, then we're interested in leveraging the power of synthetic biology and leveraging the power of fermentation technology to deliver that to people. Um, so, so yes, uh, you know, we like building things that are, that are better in addition to drop replacements for things that people have used for a long time. Uh, and uh, so that's exactly in line with the way that we think about things. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so in, in terms of the technology itself, and I, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of the audience, what, uh, how much you all know about the, uh, the different kinds of technologies, but when we talk about fermentation, I mean, it's true that we've been fermenting for millennia, but the exact technology that we're using is also, um, is also pretty novel, but not novel enough that we're kind of pioneering new ground. Uh, it's, you know, the exact same process that we use to make our proteins has been around for decades. All, in, virtually all insulin made today is made from bacteria or yeast. It's not made from pigs anymore, but that's how it used to be made before uh, companies were able to engineer microbes to produce that protein that was so critical for diabetics. It's the same, again, over 90% of cheese is used, is made by using proteins that were made from bacteria instead of having to kill baby cows in order to extract the rennet protein from their fourth stomach. So this, this exact technology has been around for decades. All we're doing is applying this old technology in a new, in a new industry, in a new way that for us, I think, we find incredibly meaningful. And so that's really the only thing novel about our process, our, about our approach, is that we're applying it to a new, to a new space. That's really it. Yeah, and I think uh, there's some good questions from the audience already. Um, and touching on what you just said, but the intersections between cellular agriculture and consumer resistance to GMOs. Now when we talk about things like rennet from E. coli or uh, citric acid from Aspergillus niger, um, on a daily basis, I guarantee you that many people are blind to the fact that these things are made with um, either genetically modified organisms or, or microbes at all. I think when you read, when you buy a, pa a pack of Sour Patch Kids and you see that there's citric acid in there, you just imagine some lemon factory somewhere with thousands of people squeezing lemons and putting them into a dehydrator or something. Uh, but that's absolutely not the case. It's probably a factory with many bioreactors uh, doing an equivalent and probably much more efficient thing. Um, and touching on, on a previous uh, topic as well, but when, you, when we go forward with this, uh, 
you will have to confront consumer resistance to GMOs. Um, and like you said, you almost want to relish in it. But where do you see where, where do you see the conflict, or how do you see yourself yeah. smoothing that over? I do think that the term GMO is, is I think, not very productive for the conversation. Fair in enough. that uh, GMOs are, you know, it's DNA, you know, products that have DNA in them, genetic material, right? It's an organism that can replicate. We produce protein. There is no genetic material in there. It's, it, 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 it you know, it spoils in the same way. It, 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 it's, it's protein that, that doesn't replicate. The organisms that, that, that produce it are contained like they are for the dozens of products produced today. So I, I do think that for us especially is, um, you know, when they think of, you know, gelatin, milk, uh, egg whites produced from fermentation, it, it, you know, you, people, I think, in their mind think of growing these organisms, these uh, products uh, in, you know, in this weird lab. And, and, and I think it, it doesn't kind of do it justice to the process of, of really how, how common uh, and, 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 and I think good the process w it really is. Yeah, I, I would kind of liken that statement to saying that, like, no, you don't have to put a tractor on the ingredient label of a box of cornflakes because it was a tool in the production <laughs> of your cornflakes. It's not the cornflake mm. itself. But you, you can understand that yeah, consumers yeah. would want to know. For sure. Now, do you dive straight in and say, yes, but these things are safe? Do you prove that they're safe? How do you... How do you massage the, the public consciousness, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and, and get them on your side. Uh, Alex, do, do you have anything to, to add? Sure, I mean, so you know, one of the things that uh, we like to focus on is working with people that have, you know, we sell to other, we're, we're going to sell to other businesses, right? Um, so they have for a long time thought about how they interact with the people that are buying things off of the shelves. Uh, I would love for somebody to go and say, hey, I want to buy this gummy bear because it's made with gels and gelatin. I, you know, I think that would be something great. But it would just be also equally amazing if somebody just said, hey, like, this is a gummy bear. It's um, made with uh, an ingredient that is like, better. It's OK if people don't like, care about you know, every single ingredient that's inside of their food. And actually, most people make decisions based on the cost of their food. Um, so. The labeling conversation, I think, is very interesting, but at the end of the day, you have to make something that is competitive like on the basis of price, um, competitive on the basis of the functionality, and that people have access to. So the, the labeling thing for me is it's like intellectually very interesting, but um, I don't, in of terms the of like, the practical importance of it, yeah. I think you just have to deliver. Um, so that's kind of my Fair enough, thought. fair enough. Yeah. Uh, speaking of competition, though, this is something that I think about a lot. <laughs> in, in the lab, if I'm pursuing some new project, my paramount criterion is deliciousness. If it's not tasty, we don't, we don't follow that experiment through to its conclusion. Um, and when you talk about competition based on price, absolutely. Uh, competition based on, but maybe you guys have some sort of moral high ground by saying, well, it's better for the planet. Absolutely, this is a selling point. A competition based on deliciousness. Do you guys are you guys confident that the things that you can produce will be as delicious as unpasteurized milk, you know, freshly freshly taken from a cow's udders on a grass-fed farm? Somewhere Sounds delicious. In, in New Jersey. Sounds delicious. I'll tell you, we're doing what we're doing because we love food, and because there wasn't the kind of food we wanted, the kind of options we were looking for at the grocery store weren't there. So we're making them, and we're not going to you know, deliver something to the store that we're not happy with that we wouldn't take home to our own families. And I think that's the answer both in terms of safety and in terms of flavor is that our standards couldn't be higher, right? And that we're not going to settle with anything less than really, really delicious, you know, I don't want to say perfection, but something certainly as close as we can get, right? Just you, to add to that, so one of the, uh, you know, this is why you should care about gelatin. Uh, with gelatin, there's one, there is one dimension that you need to optimize for, and I think this is why it's really interesting to think deeply about ingredients in general, but, you know, and like people touched on this before, if you think about ingredients in terms of their functional properties, uh, taste does not have to be the most important thing. Gelatin, people care about the stiffness. There's not a taste, there shouldn't be a scent. Uh, flavor is not something that you think about. You don't have to worry about how it fries. People care about how stiff it is. Right, so from a manufacturing perspective, this is very exciting. Um, you're, you're designing a material, right? You're designing an ingredient 
uh, I think that it's natural for people to include the dimension of flavor in a lot of these conversations, but for so many of the things that we're building with the tools of biotechnology, flavor, it, it's not even a part of the conversation sometimes. It's, you know, mouthfeel, right? It's, it's something that, you know, adds to the experience of having your food, but, but not necessarily flavor. So, uh, you know, it's, people should love gelatin as much as I do. <laughs> Um, another question, would Noma serve cultured meat <laughs> on the menu if it was available? Noma probably would not. Noma is um, veering away from meat um, in, in, on, a, on a pretty steep course right now. Um, there's actually no meat on our menu currently, and there hasn't been all year. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, it's not that we... Um, don't serve meat because we don't think it's delicious. When we buy meat, we make sure that it is from a very good farm, but that's how we consider all our products. If we buy, if we buy broccoli, we make sure it's from an organic farm, and we know our producers, and we know our farmers. This is a part of working at Restaurant Nomad. You, everything just has to be the best iteration of itself, and you have to work with the best people to get the best products. Um, Noma's going to be moving next year into a new space, and we're going to have an urban farm, and a kind of hydroponic field, but half of the year through spring and summer, we will be a vegetarian restaurant, which is very cool. And my job uh, within Noma is to really try and exalt vegetables via fermentation and be able to make vegetarian dishes that are the most delicious versions of themselves. And fermentation is very, very good at that. Fermentation has pathways that unlock free-floating glutamates that we all find naturally delicious. Um, you know, yeast probably engineered us to love alcohol as much as we do. Like, who's domesticating who? I really don't know. <laughs> but uh, do you guys feel as though, um, you know, the microbes that you use have, have some sort of leg up? Do you, do you feel like your egg whites might be tastier in, in some respects? Um, because of the, the, the microbes that you're using? Do you, select the, do you select your microbes that you use because you, you trust them, really? Yeah, I mean, uh, so you mentioned like Aspergillus oryzae as the organism used to produce soy, uh, soy sauce and a bunch of other products. And that is actually a great organism to produce a bunch of protein as well. And so for us, when we select for microbes, I think it's more on, on the performance capabilities. Ultimately, I think to move to, to Ryan's point is at the, at the end of the day, the, uh, the microbe is the processing aid. All it does is it, it, it converts sugar into protein. And at the, at the end of the process, it's pure protein. Uh, and so for us, I think the microbe is more of, you know, how efficient can we produce them? Uh, how efficient can, can, can we get the, the microbe to produce the protein? to get it to be as sustainable a process as possible. So for us, that's more or less how we select. But in terms of, of, of making better products, is that egg whites, as you can imagine, have a bunch of different proteins. And they contribute to foaming and leavening. And, and the proteins themselves are the ones that contribute to those properties. And so you can actually dial in on those, on those functional properties by focusing on the proteins. And so, when you think about you know, foaming, for example, with, by working at the molecular level, you can actually focus on the foaming proteins to create an egg white that can make lighter and fluffier kinds of foods. I mean, imagine the, the lightest and fluffiest meringue or angel food cake that you've ever had. Like with biology, these things are now possible. Yeah. Uh, another question from the audience, I think it's a good one. Um, Research that has either been done or needs to be done around the health implication of cellular agriculture. Uh, do you foresee do you foresee any adverse effects? I mean, with with uh, Afinur, you're it's it, you're already using things that are there, and that's it's it's an interesting topic because like myself and yourself, we use things that already exist, and no one's going to say, oh, well, you use yeast not in, not with grapes, but with apricot juice. Like, what are the health effects of that? I don't think people really wonder. Um, but when it comes to 
tailoring microbes. Um, I think you guys understand the science. Well, you guys do understand the science better than the public. Can you can you back it up and say yes, this is safe because they're because X, Y, and Z? Uh, I mean, there's there's a regulatory process in place. Uh, you apply for a designation that's called generally recognized as safe. Uh, it's a combination of showing that the uh, organism that uses a platform for producing your material is something that has been used in the past for foodstuffs. Uh, and at the same time, you show that the material that you're making is something that's already, or at least for quite some time, has been consumed by people. You know, so in the case of, you know, somebody had a question about uh, rennet, uh, I think, before, right? So in the case, you know, you can say, oh, you know, this is how people have made rennet using fermentation. These are the particular organisms that have been used, and they have been shown to be safe. And rennet is something that people have been using in food processes for quite some time. Uh, and that is how the, the rennet people put together their story for the generally recognized as safe designation. And that is how every single group puts together their, their uh, story for the generally recognized as safe designation. So there is a, uh, a regulatory framework there that, you know, we'll all have to work within uh, that, you know, makes a very good case, I think, that, that the products that we're making are, are safe. And I think I would just add, not just as safe, but potentially even safer. Yeah, I mean, I was... our protein, our product would be, you know, imagine a salmonella-free egg white. You can drink them like Rocky and be completely okay with it. Uh, you know, pus-free milk. I mean, who doesn't want that? It's true, it's true. And I, I used to be a butcher, um, <laughs> oddly enough. Um, and I can say that, you know, sometimes things go off. They do. It's, it's just a fact of life. Um, more questions from the audience. Um, and this is a good one. Uh, it is expensive to make right now. Um, how do you see yourselves bringing the costs down? Um, and it, it kind of ties into another question I saw about uh, the luxuriousness of these products. And, you know, would, would Noma serve these products? Or it makes more sense that they would be tailored to uh, mass market. So how do you see yourselves, well, beyond just scalability, but the more specifics of uh, bringing the cost of these products down? It's, it's absolutely paramount importance to us because we only get to achieve the impact that we're really looking for if we're broadly, you know, mainstream mass appeal and in front of as many people as possible. If, if only 12 people in the world can try it, then we can't really talk about planetary scale problems, right? Because we're only solving problems for 12 people. And at that scale, you're really probably creating more problems than you solve. And so that's an important point, too is your ability to scale up the process um, brings the cost down and brings the, I think, efficiency up and therefore the sustainability, right? So uh, I think the more interesting answer to this question than yes, we're going to be doing development you know, ourselves with our R&D team, and that's one way we, you know, we just increase the efficiency of the, of the microbes, but more importantly, I think that there are things, uh, there are externalities that aren't being factored into the cost of dairy uh, and certainly other animal products today um, I think that when you go to the grocery store and you spend, for every dollar you spend on, a, you know, on milk, you're actually spending another dollar in taxes that we don't see because it kind of trickles through these, uh, these tributaries of government you know, subsidies and all these other sort of things that don't exist for our field. And I think you know, another question that was on there before was how do we lobby? Um, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I think that's going to be an important part of it is, is having the people of the world, you know, everyone here and everyone you know, maybe watching the video, um, speaking up about it, right, and saying this is something that we need and want, um, and it needs to be supported, I think, at least as seriously as we're supporting the uh, imperfect status quo. So I'll, I'll follow up on that, because, um, so we launched, we launched our first product, right, and the, um, the idea was actually to, to start with a very premium product um, to kind of showcase what we could do with, with microbes. So it's a coffee and like, you know, anything else you, you've tried. And, and what, what we tried really is not to make something as delicious as something else, but really to kind of open new flavor landscapes and go into directions that are not, you know, possible with other types of, of processing or processes for, for coffee. Um, so yeah, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit like our Tesla Model S and it's, gonna, it's going to appeal to people that are, you know, uh, Family are with, with, with premium coffee, with people that are into specialty food, maybe with wine enthusiasts. Um, and, and we've chosen to, to launch it on, on, on Kickstarter to have this kind of open discussion and start creating a niche of people that are you know, familiar with microbes and, and with, with biotechnology and, and this very interesting interface that we are, we are building. Um, but, but moving forward, um, we, we, we're, we, we're working on, on grains, for example, and that's where there's a lot of 
um, very interesting, um, world-changing potential, especially around you know, the, the uh, um, proteins. And, and in grains, for example, there's about 20 to 25 percent of proteins that are non-digestible by humans. And you can use tailored fermentations to make those uh, available. So that's one of the things that we're working on. Uh, but to get there, we wanted to you know, launch this first product quickly and, and start this, this kind of open discussion. So that's you know, how we've been um, addressing the, the question. And following up with the openness of this discussion, um, my, myself being a chef, you know, when I started cooking maybe 12, 13 years ago, your, your boss had his little uh, cue cards of recipes like locked away in the office. And the, the willingness to share is something um, that has grown, especially in the world of cuisine, but all over the world. We see Elon Musk releasing the patents for um, you know, Tesla's batteries to spur on the field. Uh, and uh, a question that talks about uh, transparency, um, if your investors don't want you to share your IP, do you feel as if this is um, a hindrance, or do you want it to be as open as possible? Do you want to have competitors who will share and share alike? Um, what, what do you guys think? So I, I think there's a lot of room for transparency without disclosing sensitive intellectual property. And what I mean by that is the IP concerns, like, how are we making these proteins, not how are we approaching the problem or, or how do we approach sustainability? What are our goals? How are, you know, just like letting people into that thought process and, and inviting them to the table, I think, is a big part of it and a big part of what's missing right now in big food. So that's, that also, I think, speaks a little bit to the um, consumer sentiment on GMOs, too, where a lot of times we get the feeling that it's, it's really almost more about the way the companies are behaving than the products that they're making. And it's, it's almost more about IP sometimes, right? And about these uh, kind of predatory practices against farmers. And it, it's all this other stuff. And I think all that other stuff is where it's really important to be transparent. And IP is something that we want to be able to show with people, but there are established ways of doing that, namely through licensing, right? And I think we, you know, we're really interested in doing that in having as many people as possible make milk this way. Um, one thing that I think isn't brought up enough when, when the Tesla patents you know, are, are mentioned is they're released at an important time. They're not released immediately, right? And so there needs to be a little bit of defense built, I think, before you can go out there um, and share it with everyone. But that's definitely the goal, right? Because it doesn't work if we're the only ones doing it. Okay. And uh, I think we're just about out of time. Um, I would just like to thank all of you guys. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. Could I say one thing? Yeah. Could we hear about the, the coffee you brought? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so it's available online, affiner.com. Um, so, so really what we try to do is really kind of open new flavor landscapes, go into new directions that are not, you know, trivial for, for, for premium coffee. So it's coffee that has no bitterness, no astringency. Uh, it has very interesting notes of, of, of citrus, of chocolate. Um, it's very easy to, to digest. So um, the initial, one of the initial ideas was actually also in line with uh, kind of cutting one animal out of the equation. There's one of the most premium coffee and thought after coffee in the world that is called Kopi Luwak coffee, which is um, a coffee that is eaten by a small, weird Indonesian cat that roams around the coffee plantation and, and eats the coffee beans and digests them. And um, well, people you know, uh, clean them and, and roast them, but it makes for one of the most interesting and most expensive coffee in the world also. Um, so the initial process behind this coffee was inspired by Kopi Luwak. And we wanted to go beyond that. And, and also the, the wider goal of Affiner is, is to you know, make um, plant-based products that are healthier uh, and more nutritious using, using fermentations. So that's the story. Cool. That's cool. Kindred spirits, you and I. Um, but yes, we are just about out of time for this panel. I would like to thank all of you guys very much. Um, I've, since I met Isha at a wedding that I was catering, oddly enough. <laughs> many years ago. Um, I, I've been fascinated by this field. And um, from a chef's perspective, to even talk about, you know, that you could, you could tailor a product that you've used via fermentation to create brand new flavors um, is just, it, it, it feels like a candy store of possibility. Um, whether it's gelatin or egg whites, um, I hope to all see your guys' products in kitchens one day, um, both at home. Um, and in two and three Michelin star restaurants.
But uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank and, you. Uh, thank yeah, you. So concludes the panel on presentation.